These Zelda games were terrible because the developers had to create working games with a tiny budget in a small time frame on a device with outdated specs while being pressured by a publisher that wasn't experienced in the gaming industry. That's the short answer to this question, that's why we ended up with cutscenes like this. You've killed me! Good. We look at the CDI Zelda games as one huge meme. I mean, I know I do. These games were the gift that kept on giving in the early YouTube poop days. And I'd venture to say that were it not for those videos, Nintendo may have successfully buried them into obscurity. I was going to move on directly to Ocarina of Time and other Zelda games in that era, but I wanted to take a serious look at how these games were made, why they ended up like this, and how Sony was indirectly involved. This is technically a part of Zelda history, and I really don't think I should skip this. So in this origin oracle, we look at none other than the origins of CDI Link. I'm the Ben Talk. Give your boy a follow on Twitter slash X if you're into that dumpster fire. Grab a yeah. snack, relax, and let's head back in time. You are my prisoner. Hey! Silence! We'll start by looking at Link, the faces of evil. One of two Zelda games released for the Philips CDI in America in October 1993. There's a third game in this bunch, but we'll get to that a little later. This Gee, it sure is boring around here. Is Link. An adventurer living in the peaceful kingdom of Hyrule with nothing better to do. I don't think this detail really matters in the grand scheme of this game, but I'd venture to say that this version of Hyrule is its own thing, but rooted in some of the lore established in the 1989 Legend of Zelda cartoon. Be sure to check that video out if you haven't. So Faces of Evil opens with Link hanging around Hyrule Castle, with Zelda and her father, King Harkinian. I wonder what's for dinner? The king's wizard, Gwonem, flies in on his magic carpet and lets everyone know that Ganon decided to start some shit on the island of Korodai that day. But according to prophecy, only Link can defeat Ganon. Great, I'll grab my stuff. Excited to go on another adventure, Link grabs his sword, asks for a kiss from Zelda, and gets brutally rejected in the process. You've got to be kidding. So you're telling me there's a chance. On Korodai, Ganon created these massive mountainous structures resembling the face of his minions, and they're aptly named the Faces of Evil, hence the name of the game. The player can select a couple locations in Korodai they'd like to go, and Gwonem will transport them from there. Squadola, we are off. Now the first thing you may notice is that the gameplay isn't really like a traditional Zelda game, probably taking most of its cues from Zelda 2 The Adventure of Link. It's a side-scrolling action game that has enemies roaming the map, and it's up to the player to get Link to the end section of each stage, or defeat a boss to clear them. Lucky shot! Golly! Damn. Much like in the original Zelda game, enemies drop rupees, or rubies, when they're defeated. And Link can head over to our boy Morshu's store to buy power-ups and items to help him on his quest. Morshu is one of the more popular faces from the CDI games. This guy only has two lines, but is somehow an internet legend. Sorry, Link. I can't give credit. Come back when you're a little... Richer. This meme seems to be timeless, and to take this a step further, no one can seem to track down the guy who originally voiced Morshu. A Jeffrey Nelson is credited as the actor for the role, but the internet is looking at this with some scrutiny. There's an excellent video by Wavy WebSurf that goes further down this rabbit hole. Then there's these extremely inconsistent animated cutscenes that we see throughout the game, which is a source of most of the memes. They're all fully voiced, which would make this the very first game where we hear Link and Zelda speak. I guess that's worth a kiss, huh? Huh. I won! Now even argue that some of these animations aren't that bad for the time, but we'll get into the story behind these in a little bit. The rest of this game has Link going from stage to stage, occasionally interacting with characters that will assist him in different ways throughout his quest to defeat Ganon and his minions. At some point during the game, Ganon kidnaps Princess Zelda and puts her under a sleeping spell, raising the stakes of this little field trip. In the darkest nightmare hour, when not moon nor sun has risen, I take Zelda in my power. I shall keep her in my prison. So one by one, Link defeats Ganon's major minions, Horonu, Harlequin, Militron, Blutko, and Lupe, all original characters established within these titles. And after obtaining the Book of Korodai, the item needed to seal Ganon away, Link storms Ganon's lair, chucks the book at him, seals him within its pages, and rescues Zelda. I just saved you from Ganon. You did not. Oh, I almost punched you in your chest just now. Restoring peace to Korodai, and by extension, Hyrule. The overall plot is pretty simple, and the gameplay, a little janky. But this is the Mentalk channel, so allow me to shed some light on why that is. 
First, we have to fast forward back to 1989. Nintendo's doing pretty well for themselves after the success of the Nintendo Entertainment System and all of their new intellectual properties that came with it. With the Super Nintendo on the cusp of hitting the market, Nintendo turned to none other than Sony to begin development of a CD-ROM based peripheral for the Super Nintendo. This would allow developers to ship out a lot more data within their games and include groundbreaking new visuals like pre-recorded videos for cutscenes. Sony did as Nintendo asked and developed the CD-ROM peripheral, even having a prototype that they revealed at the Consumer Electronics Show in June 1991, and they called it PlayStation. What? So what happened? Considering what we know now, this seemed like a great idea, right? Well, only one day after Sony showed off the prototype, Nintendo announced that they were dissolving their partnership. According to a 2009 Edge magazine article, Sony originally proposed to hold onto the revenue from future CD sales, and they would have Nintendo hold the revenue from cartridge sales, and then they would figure out how they'd share the revenue at a later date. Nintendo did not like this nope. proposal. Chris Deering, an employee at Sony-owned Columbia Pictures at that time, said, quote, Nintendo went bananas, frankly, and said that we were stepping on its toll booth and that it was totally unacceptable. They just couldn't agree, and it all fell apart. So in response, Nintendo would run off to the other company that pioneered CD-ROM technology, Philips, while the pissed off Sony president at that time, Norio Oga, would give Sony the green light to move forward into joining the video game market and invest in making the PlayStation a reality. So I'm sure you all know how that ended up. Hey, plumber boy, mustache man, your worst nightmare has arrived. Pack up your stuff! On the flip side, Nintendo had Philips working on their new Super Nintendo CD-ROM drive add-on. But while they were working on this project, Nintendo changed their mind yet again. Influenced by the failure of their competitor Sega and their new CD hardware, the Sega CD. So as part of pulling out of their short-lived partnership, Nintendo threw Philips a bone and gave them the license for some of their characters for games on their Philips CDI players. Of course, Philips would go for the popular ones, and Link and Zelda were chosen, as well as Mario. You know what they say, all toasters, toast, toast. <laughs> okay. Perhaps we'll talk about that game some other time. And keep in mind, these CDI players weren't exactly gaming consoles, but they were meant to be somewhat of an all-in-one device. I kind of equate it to the early days of the smart TV where it seemed like a good idea to have your TV run everything, but it actually sucked for a good while because most of them were sluggish and all the apps ran slower crashed. Animation Magic would be the studio behind the first two Zelda games on the CDI. Link, the faces of evil, and Zelda, the wand of Gamelon. This was a Russian-American animation studio based in Maryland and Massachusetts by founder Igor Razbov and Dale Descheron. Descheron would be the one to take point on the Zelda titles, serving as their director and producer. And while I was doing research on this video, I was extremely curious what the developers of this game had to say. I managed to track down discussions about the game with Descheron from author John Sapeniak, who compiled their conversations over an entire year. For what it's worth, Descheron was actually quite experienced when it came to both gaming development and CD-ROM technology, originally involved with work for both Atari and Commodore in the early 80s, and was part of a team that set some of the technical standards for audio CDs. He'd be brought onto a company called Spinnaker Software that partnered with Philips to create games for the eventual CDI systems. But the team at Spinnaker grew less and less interested in making games for the CDI, which led Desseron to leave the company. Long story short, Philips tried to make this all-in-one device, but constant delays in development caused the technology to run away from them. A system that initially was intended for release in 1988 was delayed to 1991 with outdated specs. So by 1991, PC and Mac computers had the latest and greatest chips that would run CD technology with ease. The Philips CDI, on the other hand, was rocking 1987 specs, which immediately explains the atrocious loading and sluggish screen scrolling within the Zelda games. Philips also had a lack of experience in the gaming market, which had them release a controller that paled in comparison to the extremely responsive ones that could be found on a Nintendo or Sega system at that time. In addition to all of that, the CDI had no built-in audio capabilities like video game consoles, which meant all of the audio had to be pulled directly from the CD-ROM itself. So if the CDI was trying to play music from the CD, it was difficult to also search the CD for graphical data at the exact same time. I'm simplifying this quite a bit as Desheron goes into much more technical detail, and I'll include this article in the description below, but from the start, the CDI already made it difficult for these developers to make games work. So. Enter Nintendo with their agreement to license these iconic characters. And you 
gotta help us. Desharon said, quote, Somehow Philips got a deal with Nintendo to license five characters. We pitched separate ideas for a game starring Link and a separate one with Zelda. The development budgets were not high. As I recall, they were perhaps around 600 grand each. So to bring down costs, Desharon would be put in touch with Igor Razboff, who joined him in creating Animation Magic, based in both Russia and the United States. They'd hire Russian animators to work on these games, which in turn meant cheaper labor. Razboff went over and found about six people who had some experience with 2D animation. We brought them over here to the US for six months and put them up in an apartment. We gave them computers and scanners. The animators had varying levels of skill in terms of animation. Nintendo's only input was we ran the design document and character sketches past them for approval. So this would explain why the animations are pretty inconsistent. Because memes aside, there are a few scenes that I would say are passable. Check out the transitions on this one. Keep this lantern full, it'll light your way. Thanks! As for the actors, the Animation Magic team would audition local union actors for the in-game voices. Jeffrey Rath and Bonnie Jean Wilbur voice Link and Zelda respectively, and are actually now contributing their talent to an indie title called Arzette, The Jewel of Faramore, a game entirely inspired by the original Zelda CDI games. The Animation Magic team intentionally rejected the traditional top-down view of Zelda, knowing that Philips wouldn't have approved that style of gameplay, since it wouldn't have taken full advantage of the CDI's capabilities. And within a year's time, they developed these two titles, and as you'd expect, they required an insane amount of crunch, especially with the technology being so new. Surprisingly, these games weren't even panned by critics upon release. In fact, they were positively received mainly by CDI owners who were desperate for gaming content at that time. But if you look back at some of these reviews, there's some praise here. SNES Force Magazine described the games as breathtaking, giving props to both the graphics and sound. Joystick Magazine scored Faces of Evil at a 79%, giving praise for its music, sound effects, and playthrough time. Of course, I'm not saying everybody praised it at that time, like CDI Magazine who gave it a 65%, but these publications definitely didn't look at these games as the worst thing ever. And chances are, if you ask people about this game now, they'll scoff or laugh at it. And I'm no different, which is why I wanted to make this video in the first place. I truly wanted to understand what these developers went through, and I'd come to find out that Desharon was fully aware of this shift in public opinion for these games. And in response, he said, quote, I can understand that people were disappointed, given the amount of time that we had and what we were creating at the time in terms of company infrastructure. I thought we did a good job. We weren't Nintendo. I would imagine that anything was going to fall short of that, in terms of the amount of time and energy that Nintendo puts into gameplay. I felt that given the circumstances developing two games at once on a platform that was pretty limited, we did a good job. It could have been better, of course, but it wasn't Nintendo. Dale Desharon would pass away in 2008 from leukemia shortly after these discussions. But before we move on, I'll leave you with one last quote from him. Every game has its story. Not just the story of the game, but a story of what the situation was in terms of how it was built, where it went, and what the different facets are, in terms of timing, money, constraints from the hardware, and constraints from the publisher. So I have a lot of compassion and empathy for all the companies that get great games actually made and out the door. And if it's any consolation, these same animators would go on to work on King's Quest VII a year later, a game hailed at that time for animation that captured the essence of Disney. And even though these games may have been ridiculed at some point, I'd argue now that the mocking has evolved into a new appreciation for these titles, with entire fan projects dedicated to keep this uncanny version of Zelda alive and well. It still amazes me to see the impact these titles have had on gaming, animation, and YouTube culture. And though he's not around to see this transformation, Dale Desharon has definitely left us with a legacy that will be around for years to come. Zelda, Duke Onklet is under attack by the evil forces of Ganon. I'm going to Gamelon to aid him. But father, what if something happens to you? This is Zelda, the Wand of Gamelon the very first game where you play as the person the series is named after. Considering this was developed alongside Faces of Evil, there isn't much difference to this title gameplay-wise. But the story is its own separate thing with little connection to the events of Faces of Evil. The game begins with King Harkinian planning to help Duke Gauntlet of Gamelon, who is having a rough time with Ganon. How he freed himself from the Book of Koridai is anyone's guess. But strangely enough, the king wants to head to Gamelon himself with the Triforce of Courage. I'll take the Triforce of Courage to protect me. If you don't hear from me in a month, send Link. And as you'd expect, he doesn't return in a month, so it's Link's turn to jump in. Go to Gamelon and find my father. 
great! I can't wait to bomb some Dodongos! The backup plan also fails. I know people make fun of how quickly time passes here, but I can't help but think this attempt at comedy was intentional. Anyway, that leaves Zelda to head out on her own adventure to save her father and Link. So it's off to Gamelon with Impa as her guide, and as anyone would guess, the king was captured by Ganon. And much like Faces of Evil, Zelda will travel across Gamelon, defeating Ganon's set of minions, Gibdo, the three witches of the fairy pool, Iron Knuckle, Wizrobe, Anfak, and Ganon's right-hand man, Hecton. By the way, Zelda is f ruthless in this game. He's dead. You've killed me! Good. My girl isn't taking a single prisoner. During her adventure, Zelda also meets several different characters that help her on her quest. Unfortunately, no more through this time. But there is this one character named Lady Alma who she rescues, and I'll let this exchange speak for itself. You know Link? Sure, he gave me his canteen for a kiss. You kissed him? Animation aside, I think this scene is pretty funny. At some point in the story, it's revealed that Dukonclet of Gamelon was in cahoots with Ganon the whole time, and set up King Harkinian to be captured from the very beginning. This leads Zelda to obtain the Wand of Gamelon and the Shrine of Gamelon so she can defeat Ganon. And once it's in her possession, she heads over to Ree Song Palace where Ganon has set up his base. You dare bring light to my lair? You must die! After an ass-clenching battle, Zelda uses the wand to seal him away in what I assume is the Book of Korodai? I think they just decided to reuse this animation. Either way, he's defeated, and Zelda heads back to Hyrule with her rescued father. With Duke Onklet's plans now outed, he begs for mercy. Please, your omnipotence, have mercy! Mercy? <laughs> <laughs> So everyone is happy, but there's one mystery that hasn't been solved. What happened to Link? Oh, he was a bore anyway. Stop looking at yourself. Whoa, hey guys. Wait, so you're telling me this chick trapped him in her mirror the entire time and we're just gonna skip over that? This game always seems to be considered the better of the two titles, and I do think the overall plot is a little bit more interesting than Faces of Evil. And it's always cool to see Zelda depicted as a cutthroat warrior. There would be one more Zelda title that was created for the CDI, which many agree is the worst of the three. And so I found this champion of strength and courage. It is you, Princess Zelda, with this magic pendant. This is Zelda's Adventure, released in 1994, eight months after Faces of Evil and Wand of Gamelon. But this time, a new developer would step up to create this game, Veritas Corporation, which explains why this looks drastically different from the other two titles. As the name suggests, the game stars Zelda, who sets out on an adventure to save Link from Ganon. And instead of animated cutscenes this time, this team got full-blown actors for this story. This was something I saw a lot in PC games growing up, especially educational games, and it was jarring then, but it's still jarring now. The game only opens with a really, really old guy who the manual says is an astronomer named Gaspra. Gaspra here opens a letter to find out Ganon, with two ends, has taken over the southeastern region of Hyrule known as Ptolemac. That's Camelot backwards, by the way, how creative. So Gaspra sends Zelda to Ptolemac to find Link and defeat Ganon. And for some reason, only Princess Zelda can do this. But I will say throughout the series, we have seen the Hyrule royal family are very quick to step up in order to save their kingdom. So I won't say this one is too out of character. So the game begins and it looks terrible. Damn. And once again, there's a reason for this. Much like the faces of Evil and Wand of Gamelon, this game had quite a small budget. So the team at Verides had to get creative. As you immediately notice, this time Zelda would return to the top-down adventure style that we see in traditional Zelda games, but instead they went with these graphics. So Verides not only were asked to create a game based on A Link to the Past, but also to utilize all of the CDI's capabilities, including graphics, audio, animated cutscenes, etc. A developer on the project, Jim Belcher, had an interview regarding Zelda's adventure back in 2007, and revealed that the team built out the backgrounds for the game by taking videos of scenery in Santa Monica. But these videos didn't have enough variety for them, so Belcher said, quote, Almost all of the scenery was shot in the Los Angeles area. We barely had a budget for lights, much less travel expenses. Some of the background terrain textures were shot in Hawaii by me from a helicopter in the previous fall before starting the project. But they were vacation type pics. We were desperate for interesting terrain photos, so everybody's holiday pics were fair game. The top-down character view that we see in game was a result of photographs of the actor, who were all in-office staff by the way, so no union actors were hired this time around. The Zelda we see in the intro was played by the office receptionist at the time, Diane Burns, and Gaspar here was Mark Andrade, the composer for the game's music. 
The team had to rig a mirror onto the ceiling to properly shoot the photos, and for characters that required a walking animation, they would use overhead photos of the actors walking on a treadmill. In addition to all of this, Jim Belcher disclosed that the hardware itself was a great source of frustration, which like the other Zelda CDI titles caused laggy screen scrolling and audio, and to top it off, the controller was slow and caused a lot of headaches. Apparently, even after the game was complete and submitted to Philips, it sat in the test phase for two years, a longer amount of time than the actual development time for the game. In regards to this, Belcher said, quote, One of the biggest problems of spending so long in test is that your chances of fixing certain bugs actually diminishes. This is because your primary programming resources get deployed to other projects, or worse, leave for another job. And this is exactly what happened with Zelda's adventure. The lead programmer, Randy Casey, had long since left for other ventures by the time it was time for Zelda's adventure. But don't get me wrong, the team at Verides were actually striving to make a good game. The project was simply too ambitious for the CDI. Hollywood special effects expert Jason Bakudis, who worked on films like Jason Goes to Hell and Critters 3, starring Leonardo DiCaprio, was brought in by Jim Belcher to assist with creating miniatures for creatures that would serve as the enemies within the game. Bakudis sculpted each model using clay and cast them with latex and polyfoam, each meticulously crafted so they could be posed and properly animated. And he was also involved in the prosthetics that would be put on 23-year-old Marc Andrade to make him look like Old Man Gaspara. But once again, due to all the limitations of the CDI, the resolution of all of the pictures of the actors, the backgrounds, and creature models had to be shrunk down to what we see in the end product. And to quote Bakatis, the world never got to see just how cool this game could have been. It's like we took HD 1080 pics and turned them into tiny low-res thumbnails, but worse. The problem was more with the hardware than with the content going into it. The programmers were constantly removing things so that it would run at all. So there you have it, another game ruined by the outdated Philips CDI hardware and limited budget. The game itself is rather unremarkable for that reason, but has become rather rare over the years. If you're trying to track down a copy of this game, get ready to spend at least $400 on a copy. I see some of these listings for upwards of $1,000, and personally, I can't justify any of these asking prices, so... Maybe a collector in the comments can verify whether or not these are fair. But unlike the meme culture that bred from Faces of Evil and Wand of Gamelon, this is mostly just looked at as a forgettable title in the CDI library. But just to put a cap on Zelda's adventure here, she's tasked in traveling to shrines across Tolomac, vanquishing the minions of Ganon one by one to regain each celestial sign. And though there are characters throughout the game that help Zelda, they definitely lack personality, and the acting is mostly phoned in. Little one, I hope I can be of help to you. Uh, did you see my dog out on Upper Street? It's hard to care about these characters when their models are so low quality as well. There is this Easter egg though. Radical dude, totally! This two second skateboarding guy took the world 24 years to discover. A minor cameo of a character that was going to serve as the main protagonist of another Verides project, Food Dude. A CDI title that never saw the light of day. But I digress. After besting Ganon's minions, Zelda heads to his lair for a gripping final battle. And once defeated, Ganon spins to death. Peace returns to Tolomac, and Link is saved. He doesn't say anything, so I guess this game got one thing right. So that's Zelda's adventure, huh? Surely the critics must have thrown tomatoes at this back in 1994. 84% from CDI Magazine, huh? Electric Gaming Monthly says the CDI player is really starting off on the right foot. The backgrounds are extremely beautiful, plus the colors are filled with gorgeous graphics. Hmm. 73% from Power Unlimited calling the backgrounds detailed and the game an excellent adventure. While these games may be terrible now, these developers were definitely onto something with the tools that they were given. These were developers that were working with brand new technology on outdated hardware, dealing with crunch times, and a publisher that put in mandates that limited the team's ability to think outside the box. And despite how we feel about them now, these games still play an important role in Zelda history. So I hope you all walk away from this video with a new understanding of the journey of these developers and maybe a new appreciation for developers that manage to deliver quality games. While we may look at games based on what the critics say or what the overall internet hive mind is thinking, every game has its story. <laughs>